so just to kind of just to expand on that for one second so i i feel like it's worth reiterating it because it's it's, it's a test that comes all, all the time so the nth term test also known as the test for divergence and why do we call it the test for divergence right exact 100 percent. that's excellent so it just says if the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence is not zero so i should point out right that means the sequence could either converge to a number like five or could not exist so if this limit doesn't exist then the series from n equals one to infinity of a sub n diverges. So a couple examples, just so we can see them. I um, mean, here's one example. Yeah, yeah. So for example, this series from n equals one to infinity of two n plus one over three n plus five, this definitely diverges because the limit as n goes to infinity of 2n plus 1 over 3n plus 5 is equal to what? Not quite. So you're, you're, you're thinking the right way. You're just seeing the wrong thing. So whenever you're looking at a rational expression like this, you want to look at the n to the highest power. So that we have an n to the first tier and an n to the first tier. So those coefficients, two and three, are the coefficients that matter. You could also do it the long way where we like divide everything by n to the highest power. Right? Like you could totally write it like the limit as n goes to infinity of two n divided by n plus one divided by n over three n divided by n plus five divided by n. And then say two n divided by n is just two. One over n goes to zero. 3n over n is just 3, and 5 over n goes to 0. So we end up getting 2 thirds. But yeah, it's always the terms of the highest powers. So because this limit is not 0, that's why this diverges. In a similar way, we could say the series from, I don't know, I, you don't even have to start at 1. You can only start anywhere from n equals 7 to infinity of negative one to the n plus one times, I don't know, n squared plus five n plus six over three n squared plus two n plus one. This is also going to diverge. Now, the difference between this one and the previous one is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence. Well, the problem here is that since we've got this alternating sequence, Right, the negative one example, so many change signs. Mm -hmm. The actual, like the non alternating part, the n squared plus 5n plus 6 over 3n squared plus 2n plus 1. If I ignore the alternating part for a second, what does this non alternating sequence converge to or get closer and closer to? Or what's the limit of it? Uh huh. And, we, and we, so, so they have to be the same highest power, which they are. And when they're the same, then we look at, right. So, what are we going to get? Right. So, this limit of this would be one third. The problem is it's bouncing back and forth between things that are close to positive one third and things that are close to negative one third. So, it doesn't exist. But that's still good enough, right? Not existing is still not equal to zero. So, if the limit, is equal to something that's not zero or the limit doesn't exist of the sequence, then we can say that the series diverges. It's kind of great. Um, hmm. There's one other example I should show you just because it comes up some of the time. I think it's kind of cool. So here's one more example of the nth term test in action. Or this is kind of like, this is a question I would ask on, a, on an exam for sure. Sum from n equals one to infinity of, hmm, I don't want to make it really tricky. It's kind of tricky. Let's make it a little, let's make it not too tricky. One plus one over m, the m power. Let's say we have that series. 
And this one's going to be maybe, this one might be easy enough. So nth term test. Limit as n goes to infinity of the inside stuff. Now you might not know what this limit is, but you should. But more importantly, you could probably justify to yourself that this limit is definitely going to be bigger than what for sure. And bigger than zero, even. There's another, there's a higher number I could pick that I know for sure is always getting bigger than. So let's say if we start plugging in numbers for n, like if n is two. You get one plus something squared, which is going to be bigger than one. If n is three, you get one plus something cubed, right? It's still bigger. Than, so no matter what, this limit is definitely bigger than one, which means it's not equal to zero. So you could also say this series diverges by the nth term test. Now, I should really point out. after we say this diverges, that this limit is a very, very well-known limit. That limit is equal to E. The limit is n goes to infinity. Of one plus one over n to the nth power is equal to the number E. It might not come up as much in 16 series as it does in the other two series, but it's definitely a limit that I think you should be aware of. Okay, one more kind of classic example. A series for the sum from n equals one to infinity of n times sine of one over n. And this one's a little tricky. I mean, they're all a little tricky. That's why I'm showing you them. So if we look at the limit as n goes to infinity of n times sine of one over n. I'll be perfectly honest, I actually don't remember if this type of thing gets covered in this class or not. So may, this, this might be something you actually haven't seen. Still worth seeing for just a second. So if you actually try plugging in infinity and to into infinity, one over n is going to zero and sine of zero is zero. This is what's often referred to as an infinity times zero indeterminate form. Just like infinity over infinity, we don't know what it is, or zero over zero. We don't know what it is about more work. This is another one of those things where it's like something that could be anything. Because really, it's not really infinity times zero. It's a really big number times a really small number. We just write infinity times zero because it's easier to write. But if you have something that's really, really small, but not actually zero, and something that's really, really big, but not actually infinity, it's hard to know if the thing gets really, really big or the thing gets really, really small, or so you land somewhere in between. So this one, we can rewrite it as the limit as n goes to infinity of sine of one over n over the reciprocal of n, which is one over n. And now I have to ask either you read or, God, oh my God, your name is, the, the, oh my God, I'm sorry, Caroline. I was like, I'm like, it's right there. Like, oh my God, sorry, Caroline. I'm asking either of you, does this sound familiar to you? That the limit as x approaches zero of sine of x over x is equal to. It's okay if it doesn't. I'm really, I'm really asking. Read. The limit's equal to one. That might be something you have seen. It might not. It, it might not get really taught in this class. Or since we're there, I will also point out that L'Hopital's rule would apply here. So I know you haven't seen it before here, or we talked about it last time, Caroline, but I'm going to show it to you again because it's something that's still worth having seen. So this is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity. So again, I'm using L'Hopital's rule here because I have a zero over zero. If n's going to infinity, one over infinity is going to zero, sine of zero is zero, and one over infinity is going to zero. So this is a zero over zero form, which means you're allowed to take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom, and then take the limit of that. And if it exists, then the other limit's also equal to that. So if we do that here. The derivative of sine of some stuff is cosine of that stuff times the derivative of that stuff. And the derivative of n to the negative first is negative n to the negative second, or negative one over n squared. And now, fun fact, the derivative of one over n is the derivative of n to the first, which is negative one over n squared. So what's kind of cool here is those totally just cancel each other out. 
And then if n goes to infinity, one over infinity goes to zero and cosine of zero is one. So you can either see this limit is equal to one by using L'Hopital's rule, or you can see this limit is equal to one because it follows this pattern of having sine of something over the exact same something, and both of those somethings are going to zero. If this seems kind of foreign to both of you, that's really okay. I like I said, don't sweat it. I just it seemed like a good example to go over. So these, so I should again go back to this. Then, since this limit is not zero, that means that our series diverges by the nth term test. Um, I would encourage you to get in the habit of stating the test that you are finding convergence or divergence by. So it diverges by the nth term test, or it converges by the ratio test, or it diverges by the integral. Right? We'll, we'll talk about all of them, but that's kind of the deal. So I guess the question is, should we do some midterm prep review, or should we continue talking about this? Okay, let's do that. Oh, I would just, let me say one more thing. Just because, and we're going to say it again a lot, but just so, just to reiterate what he probably said in the class, um, when you have a P series, a P series just says, if you have an summation from, I'm assuming he used K. Okay, from, it doesn't really matter, from K equals one to infinity of one over N to the K, although really you would use P here in my opinion. Um, we say that this is going to, diverge if k is um, less than or equal to one, and it's going to converge if k is strictly larger than one. He might have said it slightly differently. He might have said k has to be positive. That's not really true. Um, but it's, it's more obvious if k is negative, right? If k was negative, for example, if you have the sum, of one over k to the negative two from k equals one to infinity, that's just the sum of k squared. And obviously that diverges because nth term test. So I wouldn't really say this diverges the P series, I would say it diverges by the nth term test. Whereas if you have something like the sum from k equals one to infinity of one over k to the one half, then I would say this diverges by the P-series test. So, oh, 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 yeah. Oh, I wrote that. Man, I need to. Kill me now. Sorry, I made a dumb mistake above that I need to fix. Since P is less than or equal to one, P is one half. So I wrote this totally wrong. And I deeply, deeply apologize. Um, so the thing that's wrong here is I wrote, I, the way I've written this, my index should be N because I should have one over, like the power should be the thing that's kind of constant, not changing. So I've kind of written the totally wrong thing. So let me write this again, but let me write it the right way. So we say that the P for a P series where we actually do use the letter P typically, and also the letter K for the index, we would have the sum from k equals one to infinity of one over k to the p. That's how it actually should be written. Um, and this is going to diverge if the power is less than or equal to one, it's going to converge if the power is larger than one. That's the actual P-series thing, not the thing I wrote. This would have been fine if I had written this as n equals, here, but yeah, sorry about that. Um, so we'll come back to this. It, it's kind of, I will say the P-series test is kind of like the standard place I go to when I'm talking about convergence or divergence of a series. I'm like, is it a P-series? Do I have one over N? Like my two kind of go-to examples of things that converge or diverge is, and I talked about this last time, this is my go-to converge sum of one over N squared that converges you could start at, sorry, I, I'm just, I'm going to use N. I can't help it. Clearly, it's a problem I have. I can't help using N from N equals. You can really actually start anywhere as long as it's defined. So we usually talk about starting at one, but really, if you start at five, right, you're just chopping off some terms, it's still going to converge. Or similarly, if you have something that diverges, 
like the sum from n equals one to infinity of one over n. Well, it also diverges if you start at five, right? If something, when we say this diverges, what we're really kind of saying is it adds up to infinity. And if you chop off a finite number of terms, it's still going to add up to infinity. Infinity minus a few numbers, still infinity. So that's kind of good to recognize is that if you have something that's convergent or divergent, starting at seven terms later, 20 terms later, a million terms later, doesn't change whether or not it converges or diverges. It's kind of interesting. Okay, enough about series and sequences. We'll have the rest of the quarter to talk about them, which is rapidly ending here. We've got what, like three weeks left, something like that. Welcome to almost March. Okay, but let's talk about um, reviewing. So he's got some practice tests. I've also got some practice materials. Is there anything on this specifically you want to see, or should I just hit you with whatever I want? Okay, let's go. And let me let me see kind of study guide here. I like on the study guide, like on his test taking strategies. The fifth thing he wrote was a good night's sleep and some food before you start can help you maintain concentration for the duration of the exam, which I think is good advice. Definitely getting a good night's sleep and eating something beforehand, but also then at the end of that. Caffeinate responsibly. I appreciate that. That's, that's good advice. It makes me feel like he's seen someone who did way too much caffeine. Was like, ah. yeah. So let's see here. Yep. Mm -hmm. Surfaces, three dimensional functions. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. Sure. Cool. All right. Let's, see where my hands are. let's go. Let's look at some classifying ex uh, extrema. So, exam to review. Um, I should point out this exam to review is available. You can find it on Grant's website most easily, which I'm sure you're both familiar with, right? Grant, yeah. I will hand you this copy at the end of this if you want it. The solutions are also on there. So if you want more practice and you don't get through this, which we won't, um, you're welcome to look there and get more practice. So let's say we have the function f of x, y is equal to one minus x squared plus x squared x squared times y plus y squared plus one third y cubed. We want to locate and classify extrema. So the first step to this process is finding the critical points. So we take our partial derivatives and set them both equal to zero. So my partial derivative with respect to x is going to be minus 2x plus 2xy. And that's it. Set that equal to zero. That looks like it's going to be probably the easier one to deal with, but I'm still going to find the other partial derivative before I start trying to solve this. So my fy is going to be 0, 0, x squared, and then plus 2y plus, yeah, y squared. That's definitely way more complicated to deal with. So I'm definitely going to deal with this first. So dealing with this first, it's really in your best interest not to like, you could bring the 2x over. That's the wrong way to go. You really want to just leave everything equal to zero and factor if you can. So what can I factor out from both negative 2x and 2x plus y? Right. So I do that, I'm left with a negative one plus y equal to zero. And so we either get x equal to zero or we get y equal to one. I want to stress one more time. I know I stressed this before. Zero, one is not a critical point. So I should point out, it could be like, maybe it'll be this kind of coincidence where it happens in the being one. But if you plug in zero for X and one for Y into the other partial derivative, you get zero plus two plus one, which is three, which is not zero. And the whole idea is that both of these equations have to equal zero for whatever pair of points. So we're just going to use each of these individually. So if I, if I set x equal to zero over here, I'm going to get 2y plus y squared equal to zero. Um, I should point out. No, actually, I won't need to point out. This will this will be great. So I was going to point something out, but it'll come up in the next part. So if we solve this, I factor out a y. I'm going to be 2 plus y equal to zero. So I either get y equal to zero or y equal to negative 2, which means I have two critical points. I have the critical points. 0, comma, 0, and 0, comma, negative 2. Right, because here x is 0, and y could either be 0 or negative 2. Let's look at the other potential value where y is equal to 1. So if y equals 1, I've got x squared plus 2 
plus one equal to zero. What I want to point out here is we've got x squared plus three equal to zero, and there's no solution. That happens sometimes. Sometimes some one of the values that makes the other equation equal to zero doesn't have a solution for this other equation equal to zero. So typically, if you're asked a question like that, you will get at least one critical point, but you might not get critical points for everything that makes each equation zero. So just be aware. This could kind of feel like that seems weird, but it totally happens sometimes. If we didn't also have this equation here, then I'd be worried because like, what, there's no critical points. That seems strange, but yeah. So then we're gonna test them. So we find our capital gamma, there's a little gamma, yeah, all right. Um, so let's see, so fxx is gonna be negative two plus two y. Fyy is gonna be two plus two y, interesting. And fxy should be negative 2 plus 2y. Two I feel like I did something wrong. Did I? No, I don't think so. Just let's see. Let's check. Let's check. So I always like to check both of it feels wrong. So fxy should be, oh no, zero. That's a zero. Sorry, right? So, or that's fyx, but they should be the same. So if I look at fxy, Derivative of fx with respect to y should be zero plus two x. Or derivative of this with respect to x should be two x plus zero plus zero. So either way we're getting two x, which means we're doing the right thing. That's the right thing. So here, right? This is my fxx, fyy, fxy. So now we plug in. Now, if I was asking this kind of question on a test, I would be sure to ask a question that had at least one saddle point and at least one either max or min. So that you have to do the max or min check thing and you also, right, just so that you're kind of testing all your possibilities. So I would expect, not that that's for sure gonna happen, but it seems likely. And it's good to think about like what kinds of things you think will happen on our test. So if we plug in our first critical point, zero, zero, we're gonna get negative two times two which means we're gonna have a saddle point minus zero squared. So we're gonna get negative four, which is less than zero. So zero, zero is a saddle. Let's look at the other critical points, zero, negative two. We're plugging zero, negative two, zero for X, negative two for Y. So we're getting negative two, minus four, so negative six, and then two minus two, which is negative two, sorry, two minus four, which is negative two, and then minus zero squared. So here we're getting positive 12, which means it could either be a maximum or a minimum. Let me ask you, Caroline, which is it? Is it a max or a min? Yeah, it's a max. And why is it a max? Mm -hmm. Right. Because the second derivative of fxx or fyy, either one you want to check, is concave down. Right? It's negative. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly 100% it. Cool. So I could see you asking a question like this on a test. Um. Sure. I do. Do I have them? I have both. I have one of them. The first spring one you said? Sure. Uh huh. I feel like we haven't really talked about that. So I will point out this exam is five years old. So he might have changed how he's doing things. Um, uh, yeah, I don't feel like. So that again is another one. Right. Right. Sure. So, I mean, because have you really talked about that stuff in class? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, 
I don't like I could address it, but I don't feel like it's the best use of our time. Like I really like I feel like if you haven't talked about it in class and I don't really think it came up on your homework, I mean maybe time saved it. Um, I will just say the words if you're finding the trace, it's it's a lot like finding the intercepts. So except so if you're finding the x-intercept of something, you would set y and z equal to zero, right? Because you're setting every other variable equal to zero. If you're finding the trace in the xy plane, it's kind of like you're finding the xy plane intercept. So if I want to find the xy plane intercept, well, what would I set equal to zero? Right. So just to kind of look at this example real quick, if my function were something like f of x, that's a, no, you don't really write it as a function. If my equation were something like 4x squared plus y squared plus 4z squared equal to, mm, sure, 1. It's fairly typical. If I wanted to find the trace in the xy plane, all I would do is set equal to 0. So z equals 0, and then you're going to get 4x squared plus y squared equal to 1, which is what kind of two-dimensional shape? Almost a circle. It's a circle if the coefficients of x squared and y squared are the same. It's a, it's a, so it's not quite a perfect circle. It's an ellipse, not ellipsoid. So, so I should say, this three-dimensional shape is an ellipsoid. This two-dimensional curve is an ellipse. Um, similarly, in the, so if we went in the, yz plane. So we set x equal to zero, and we get y squared plus 4z squared equal to one, which is also an ellipse. And then finally, if we set, if we go in the, um, let's see, the xz plane, set y equal to zero, we're going to get 4x squared plus 4z squared, which is a circle. So then the idea with doing all this sometimes is that basically you graph all the traces, which I'm going to try to do here, probably not very well. So the trace in the x is z plane is a circle. And the trace in the other two planes are ellipses. So the trace in the yz plane, ellipse, and it's, let's see. So just looking at this equation here, the y intercept would be one and the z intercept would be one fourth, one half, sorry. Right, if, y, if z is zero, y is plus or minus one, right? Yeah. And if y is zero, z is plus or minus one half. It's one half squared, so okay. So the y value is bigger, so it's gonna be like, so it kind of looks like this. So there's my ellipse kind of, I mean, you can call it an ellipse if you want, if you're generous in the YZ plane. And then there's my ellipse in the XY plane. And then the whole, the whole three dimensional shape that you can kind of see now by drawing all the traces in the different coordinate planes is your ellipsoid. Again, I don't think that's going to come up really, but that's how you would deal with it if you had to. So, but yeah, trace is just kind of like what's going on in this plane, except the not variable mentioned equal to zero. Did he, what do we think about? Um, oh my gosh, that's what I'm going to look for. There's a lot of, there's a, I'm just looking at this midterm review that I have. There's a lot of sequence stuff on here, so maybe it's not the best example. Let's look at the, let's look at the double integral example. Let's say we want to evaluate the integral from zero to twenty-seven of the integral from the cube root of x to three of the square root of one plus y to the fourth dy dx. And if I was just giving a straightforward double integral like this, it probably wouldn't be straightforward. And it's not. Because if we look at that integrand, I don't know how to anti-differentiate the square root of one plus y to the fourth. In fact, it's probably literally impossible. 
So if something looks hard or maybe impossible, the thing we should do is what? Not a U sub, although that's not a bad idea. There's something we can do with double integrals. Exactly. Change the order of integration, right? So instead of doing dy dx, we want to rewrite it as a double integral with dx dy. Because then what will happen is we can definitely integrate this constant as far as x is concerned with respect to x and get x times the square root of one plus. So here's what's probably going to happen. We're probably going to integrate this and we're going to get x times the square root of one plus y to the fourth. And then whatever we plug in for x, we'll probably get, make it so we end up getting like a y cubed times the square root of one plus y to the fourth. And then when we have a y cubed times the square root of one plus y to the fourth, then we can do the u substitution. That's probably what's going to happen. That's probably usually what happens with these. So the trick here is that we have to re- write the limits of integration. And so what we really have to do is we have to draw a picture. So I'm gonna draw these two functions. So remember the inner ones here are y equals, the outer ones are x equals. So I've got y equal to the cube root of x, which looks kind of like this. And then all the way up to y equals three which we'll just say looks like this. So the intersect over here at, I'm assuming 27. And yes, of course they do because the cube root of 27 is three. So this is 27 comma three, and over here is X equal to zero. So here's the region we've just described. And of course, that's using a vertical strip, right? We're going from y equals cube root of x to y equals three. So now we want to change it up and use a horizontal strip. So we're going from a left of x equals zero to a right of, well, instead of y equals root cube root of x, what are we going to change that to? Yeah, totally. So those are going to be our new limits of integration. X equals zero to X equals Y cubed. And then the Y values are just going to go as low as zero and as high as three. And now things are going to work out great because when we integrate this with respect to X, well, since there aren't any X's there, this just gets treated like a constant. So this is going to become, we still got Y equals zero to Y equals three. And then this interintegral is going to be x times the square root of one plus y to the fourth from, and I do really recommend, especially here since it can be a little confusing, I'm going to write x equals zero to x equals y cubed. So then I'm only plugging in for x. So then I'm going to plug in and I'm going to get the integral from zero to three. If I plug in x equal to y cubed, I get y cubed times the square root of one plus y to the fourth minus zero times, I should probably just not even write that what I'm going to anyway. But this whole thing is just zero, so we don't need it. So then we've got an integral where a u substitution makes a lot of sense. So what do we gonna let u equal? Right, u equals one plus y to the fourth. My du is 4y cubed dy. So we can tell, and I, I'm going to do it. So 1 fourth du is y cubed dy. I thought that. Remember when I was Right. Okay. You, you should do whatever works for you, though. The weird way is totally fine. Okay. So the weird way that your teacher did was just to solve for dy. So you, the way your teacher would have done it would have been to say one, or really, I guess, du over four y cubed equals dy. That's what your teacher would have done. And then all that's going to replace that. So we're going to get the integral from zero to three of y cubed times the square root of one plus y to the fourth 
times du over 4y cubed. And the whole point is that that y cubed there should cancel the y cubed over there. And then the remaining stuff should be, able to, that should be a u, right? So then we've got one fourth, I'm bringing that one fourth out in front, the integral of the square root of u, du. Now we could change limits of integration. We don't have to, but we could. Um, if we did, right, if y is zero, what do you going to be? Right? And if y is three, what do you going to be? You do know what three to the fourth is. You just don't know you know it. What's three times three? What's three times three? What's nine times nine? Right. So three to the fourth is just three squared times three squared, which is nine times nine, which is 81. So plus one, that's going to be 82, which is kind of disappointing. All right, the numbers do not turn out to be nice. Oh, well. So then we're going to integrate. We're going to get one fourth u to the three halves times two thirds from one to 82. And we don't have to change back. We just end up with, let's see, one fourth times two thirds is going to be one sixth, 82 to the three halves minus one to the three halves, which is one. I could see him asking a question where he asks you to set up the integral going the opposite order, but not actually evaluate it. It's a pretty typical kind of thing to ask. Um, sure. Let's look at this. Got time. I'm trying to think of what other, like, should we do a Lagrange problem? Yeah, okay. I don't know if I love this Lagrange problem. Though. That's fine, sure. So this one, this one's probably fine. Um, so here we go. Lagrange. The temperature at any point on the ellipsoid, or egg as I like to think of it, although it's not really an egg, egg's like bigger one, but whatever. It's like an egg. Um, ellipsoid x squared plus 2y squared plus 3z squared equal to 30. By the way, right, this equation, right, this is our constraint. Is given by capital T of x, y, z is equal to 2x minus y minus 3z. Use Lagrange multipliers to find the hottest and coldest points on the ellipse. Or in other words, maximize find the maximum minimum value. Wow, that's not how you spell ellipse. Ellipples? Ellipse. Okay. Um, all right, so find where this function for the temperature is maximized and minimized with this constraint. You should, again, again assuming you're given equations and not just been like, not, so someone can say like, find the distance between these two things or find the point that's closest to this other thing. And then you'd be like, oh, I'm trying to minimize the distance. And you have to actually write down the equation for the distance. But here, where we're given an equation and a function, it should be obvious which one is the constraint because it's the one that's equal to something else. Whereas the function that doesn't equal some other number is the thing we're trying to maximize. Also, the words also make it clear. Find the hottest point means we're trying to maximize the temperature. Find the closest point means we're trying to maximize it. So essentially, we're trying to maximize and minimize capital T. Um, so I guess we should do it kind of the normal way. So we're going to, we, he likes to write the capital F, right? So capital F of X, Y, Z, lambda is equal to this function here, 2X minus Y minus 3Z minus lambda times X squared plus 2Y squared plus 3Z squared. And he likes to bring over the constant, make it equal to zero, right? Yeah. Not necessary, but totally fine to do. And yeah, totally fine. Okay, so now we have to find all of our partials. So Fx is gonna be 
2 minus 2 lambda x gonna be 0. Fy is going to be negative 1. I feel like I'm making a mistake. No, I'm not. Okay. Negative 1 minus 4 lambda y equal to 0. And Fz is going to be negative 3 minus 3 lambda z equal to 0. I feel like he does some weird stuff here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with my usual and try solving for lambda. Unless you want me to do something else. Like, number sign. Mm-hmm. So, like, three equals three. Sure, that's what I would do, too. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I will say, like, for equation three here, I would definitely divide out the three real quick and say negative one equals lambda z, right? Mm -hmm. But then, like, I feel like he likes to, like, just, like, divide them by each other, right? Yeah. Like, that's really what he likes to do. Okay, we could try that. So if we do... Let's try dividing these. So we divide this one by that one. Two divided by negative one is negative two. And two lambda x divided by four lambda y is x over two y. Which is gonna give us negative four y equal to x. Okay, that's totally fine. I will point out you can also get there by solving the mutual lambda. So alternatively, you could have said, if I solve this for lambda, 2 over 2x equals lambda, or lambda equals 1 over x. And solving this one for lambda, negative 1 over 4y equals lambda. If you set those equal to each other, you get 1 over x equal to negative 1 over 4y. If you cross multiply, you get... 4y equal to negative x, or x equals negative 4y. So it's the same, just a different way of getting there. It should be fine to do it either way. You should really do whatever just you think is easiest, most comfortable. So let's do the same thing for this other, for these other two. Sure. So if we divide them, I think he likes to number them. So like I guess I'd be like dividing two, two divided by three, right? Seems weird. It's fine. So negative one divided by negative one is one. I guess I'd probably write it out. Negative one divided by negative one equals four lambda y divided by lambda z. And then I would get one equal to four y over z. So z equals four y. Okay. And then we plug that all back into the thing we're trying to, or the, the thing that's our constraint. So then we're gonna say, or as he would probably say, plug it back all into f lambda. Right, because he you can take the the next one, which is really just not equal. So plug it back in, and let's see, we get um, so x is negative four y, so I'm gonna get a 16 y squared plus a two y squared, and the z is a four y, so I'm gonna get a three times sixteen y squared, so a forty-eight y squared equal to thirty. Sometimes the numbers come out nice if someone has thought well about the problem. I don't think they're going to come out very nice here. Um, so let's see, 48 plus 2 is 50, plus 16 is 66. So we've got 66y squared equals 30. So y squared equals 30 over 66, which reduces to, what, 5 over 11. So y is going to equal plus or minus the square root of 5 over 11. The plus or minus is important here because there is a point where it's hottest and a point where it's coldest. So finding my points, my points are going to be, well, let's see. So X is negative four times Y and Z is positive four times Y. So my points are going to be, let's do where Y is positive first. So X is going to be negative four times the square root of five over 11. Y is going to be the positive square root of five over 11. 
And Z is going to be the positive four times the square root of five over 11. And then the opposite of that, where the Y is negative and everything else changes sign. So, or four square root of five over 11, negative square root of five over 11, and negative four square root of five over 11. So then at this point, you have to kind of look and see, okay, which of those two values is going to give me something that's bigger when I plug them in? Well, if we think about plugging, let's see. So I plug in this one first. T of this, this, this is going to be two times negative four, whatever. I'm going to ignore the root for a second. So two times a negative thing, minus a positive thing, minus a positive thing. So plugging in this one's going to give me a negative number. Whereas plugging in this one's going to give me a positive number. So I can see that this one is going to be the hottest point. And this other one is going to be the coldest point. And that's really how you have to check is you get your critical points and then you can just plug them back into the original function and see what's giving you what. 